So you Hold can start on. it. Okay, and we are live. The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I wanna welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. David Slobiter. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I didn't know I was getting chosen second. Yes, I am here. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Philip White. Present. Mr. Emerald Hemery is not here. And Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. A quorum is present. Also attending the meeting tonight is Ms. Christine Brestrup, Town Planning Director. Nate Malloy, Senior Planner, will be joining us by telephone. Jacinta Williams, is Town Planner. And we also have in attendance Attorney Carol Murray of KP Law to provide guidance and assistance to us. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted in mails to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its question, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed at the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, it's a 20-day appeal period from the Greek party to contest the decision with a relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded as a registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, minutes, approval of the meeting minutes, or consideration of the approval of meeting minutes from August 29th, 2024, and September 12th, 2024. A public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-04, Wayfinders, Inc. Request a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts Gen General Laws Chapter 40B to construct a 31-unit mixed-income rental housing in a three-story development with 41 proposed parking spots on the premises of 31 South East Street, Map 15A, Parcel 20, in the RVC Village Center Residence Zoning District, and a 47-unit mixed-income rental housing in the three-story building with 46 proposed parking spots on the premises of 70 Belchertown Road, Map Parcel 15C58, 15C59, and 15C60 in the RN and FPC Neighborhood Residents and Flood Prone Conservancy Zoning Districts. This hearing is continued from August 29th, 2024. Following that, there's a general public comment period on any matters not before the board tonight and uh, time for the board to consider other businesses, business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. That's the agenda for tonight. The first order of business is consideration of the minutes from our August 29th and September 12th meetings. I have reviewed the August 29th meeting, uh, meeting minutes. 
and I find uh, I don't have any uh, changes or amendments or suggestions to them. Does anybody else have any corrections? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from August 29th. So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussions? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes of August 29th. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Uh, the vote is four to nothing with one uh, absent. The motion is approved. The next is uh, consideration of approval of the minutes of the September 12th meeting. I do have one change to this. I noticed um, that on the roll call that we listed Mr. Varner as an associate, and I think we want to list Razwana Khan as the associate member. Um, I think that's just a typo, but other than that, I have no changes. Mr. Sloviter. I actually have a change of no consequence, but as long as we're detailed oriented, maybe this was a test to see if I read this stuff. <laughs> on on page two, it says um, the, the the vote wow. the vote was really three to zero. Yes. To um, move the solar hearing, not five to zero. Yeah. Good catch. Uh, well. And um, in on page four, you referred to Mr. Varner not being on that panel, but it has that the motion to adjourn, speaking of no consequence, the motion, motion to adjourn was seconded by Mr. Varner, and I believe that Mr. White seconded it. I think and Mr. Varner wasn't there, so that would have been quite a deed. So I hope I passed and I've proven I read the minutes. Yes, <laughs> you, you, you've read them in, in de great detail. Yes, I know, and my head still throbs. You get an A for reading the minutes this week. Right, thank you very much, Coach. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we've got those two changes. Are there any other amendments to the meeting minutes from um, August or September 12th? If there are no further uh, changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. So moved. Mr. Sloviter moves. Mr. Meadows seconds. Any discussion? No discussion. The vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. The motion carries four to nothing with one absent. Motion is approved. The next order of business is um, F ZBA FY 2025-04 Wayfinders Inc. requests a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40B. Uh, we did have a site visit uh, a week ago, um, okay. both, both sites. We did pretty much the same thing at both sites. We met with the, um, the applicant at the site and the architect. Uh, we saw the, the um, site from the road, particularly on the Southeast Street, observed where the new driveway was going to be, the siting of the building itself, how it was going to mesh into the existing school. We did not go down the, the property line on the far side of the building, uh, on the north and the west side of the building, the north side of the building at a lot. We did go back following the driveway to the parking area out in back of the, uh, the where the building was going to be. And we looked at the parking, uh, where the parking would be laid out. And we observed the uh, field next to the park. And we asked questions about the water, uh, the level of water, how the water would get through, whether it would be culverted or not. We um, had questions about the number of cars, a number of parking spaces and how they would be situated. Um, in essence, that's pretty much the major questions asked at the site visit at uh, on Southeast Street. Does anybody have? Oh, we also observed where there's off street parking, uh, on street parking in the area, as, a, as well as the off street parking provided under the plan. Then we went to the other one on on um, Belchertown Road. 
we found our way back to the, uh, the site, uh, which was a bit of a drive back into the site where we observed one of the, un, one of the vacant buildings that is going to be um, uh, knocked down and replaced with a new, with a new uh, building. We saw, we looked at the lot, we saw where the parking was going to be. We made, uh, we, walked, we observed where the conservation land is, which trees were going to be cut down, uh, where there are going to be replacements of the vegetation. Um, and uh, there, was a lot, there was a lot of construction at the site, uh, not due to the applicant or not due to the applicant um, activity, but due to the work on the road by the town. Uh, and we observed the additional land that would the uh, where the building would be placed and how the parking would come up to the back of that and we observed where the front of the building would be where the new building would be um is there other things that were important did any members have anything else that they thought was important to relate to the public from our site visit craig or david or philip or, or miss Prestop or miss williams i think that pretty much sums it up oh, mr meadows there may be a couple of things. Uh, one is I remember uh, some discussion about where the old septic tank and septic field right. might be located and if that's going to pose any problems for the landscaping and for the work out there. And then it just occurred to me, uh, was there uh, any indication of an oil tank that may have been uh, left outside and if so, has that been removed? Does anybody have any indication of, of what may have happened to an oil tank if it existed out there? That's a really, that's a good question. We didn't ask at the site visit, but we should put that at the top of the items that they would talk about today on our meeting when they do their presentation. Mr. Meadows, I okay. think that's a good question. Yep. Okay. Also, we have some submissions, and Ms. Williams, I'm going to ask you to help me to make sure that I've got them all. We have a um, parking memo uh, dated September 13th from the applicant. We have snow storage. Uh, we have a site plan which shows snow storage for both 31 Southeast Street as well as Belchertown. We received um, planting plan revisions for 70 Belchertown Road. We received planning plan revisions for, I think this is for the Belchertown parking. We find, we also received Wayfinders uh, shed fence material. And we have a presentation uh, uh, dated September 16th, which I think they will, I, I suspect that they will use uh, tonight uh, as, as a, a way to walk through some of the issues. Um, I think that's the full number of submissions we've received. Am I correct? That's correct. Great. So, um, so what I what I've been talking, what we noticed is we had a, a really large list at the end of last week. We talked about almost everything that we were going to do, and I think that was a bit ambitious. And so, my goal tonight would be to go through the submissions that you had that you presented to us that were an answer to our questions from last week. It was on parking. It was on. I think there were some landscaping questions, there were some fencing questions, snow removal, I think you've had a number of those. Um, so we'd like to go through those, and then we'd like to talk about presentations on architecture and mechanical systems for this meeting, if you're prepared to do that. And then just to give you a, a kind of an idea of the future, it seems to me that if we do architecture and mechanical systems tonight, if we can meet on the 26th, if you're available on the 26th, we can talk stormwater management and infrastructure design on that night. Then we can meet on the 17th. We can talk about property management, income restrictions, and financials. And then we could meet on this, that's on the 10th, excuse me, that's the 10th. Property management, income restrictions, and financials on the 10th. And on the 17th, the applications, applicant selection process and local preference. Is that achievable from your standpoint, uh, Wayfinders? Um, yeah, that was, uh, we should be able to um, do that. I think I might have uh, received a little bit more of a advanced um, schedule um, 
earlier in the in the week. So we're we're prepared to talk if this moves along. We're prepared to kind of move, um, you know, move some through some of the items such as like stormwater this evening as well. Okay, so let's do this. Let's let's try to get because I, I haven't studied stormwater, so I'm not I'm not ready to go down stormwater. Okay. Yeah. So I think if we can do that next on the 26th, that'd be better. Let's let's focus on what we had down before us and. Again, if this gets to be too um, aggressive a schedule, too fast a schedule for you guys, uh, let us know and we can try to adjust it to make sure that we get, that you're prepared, fully prepared to present us all the information we need to have. All right? Yep. Mr. Wagner, you have your thank hand you. up. Thank you. I would uh, just ask, yes, thank you. I, I would just ask that who's ever letting people in as panelists that they Oh, uh, let in our um, our mechanical engineer who's who's logged on but hasn't been let in as a panelist yet. His name is Anthony Gray. Anthony's entering. Thank Great. you. Great. All right. So before you begin your presentation and you go through the the responses to last night's questions as well as Mr. Meadows' question about any um, old uh, oil storage tanks. Or, um, or we should also deal with that tonight. Can we get um, each of you who are going to present tonight to give us your name and address for the record? So Mr. Wagner, we can start with you. Thank you. My name's uh, Bob Wagner, uh, principal at the Narrow Gate Architecture. Mr. Gruber. Uh, my name is Jamie Gruber and a project manager with Wayfinders um, from the Northampton office. Ms. Fryman. Uh, good evening, Ellen Fryman with Shaw Schwartz and Fenton, 1441 Main Street, Springfield. Mr. Horsley. Uh, good evening, Colin Horsley, uh, senior project engineer at Niche Engineering um, out of our Boston office. Mr. Bankston. Hi, good evening. Andrew Bankson, architect with Narrowgate, uh, 11 Hastings Lane, Medford, Massachusetts. Mr. Gray. Hi, Anthony Gray with ACAL Engineering, the mechanical fire protection plumbing engineer on the project. And our office is located in central Massachusetts in Berlin. In where? In Ber Berlin, Berlin. Outside, of, outside of Marlboro. All right, Mr. Hoagley. So Scott Hoagley, I'm with Electrical Systems Engineering. I'm the Chief Electrical Engineer. We're seeing the electrical design for this project. Our office is located in Derry, New Hampshire. Great. Thank you. Mr. Soares. Hi, good evening. Joshua Soares, Project Manager with Niche Engineering, the Project Civil Engineer, um, with headquarters in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, Mr. Scopit Scopitone. You're muted right now. There we go. Hello, Sam Scopitone. I'm a project manager with Wayfinders uh, based in Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm just assisting um, Jamie Gruber. Great. All right. Thank you all. Um, so let's let's start with the responses to some of the questions we had from last week. And um, I think you provided uh, the big one was was parking. There was a lot of discussion about parking last week, and you provided some drawings as well as a study um, that you that I reviewed earlier today. Um, so, do you want to walk us through that first topic? Sure, I can. I can do that. All right. Can you uh, see my screen? Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Um, Thank you again for, for having us here tonight. And uh, just to talk about a little bit about the parking, I'm just gonna show a, a site location map here showing you know where the, the properties are located and how close they are to the um, the bus bus routes here that were mentioned in the um, in the parking memo. There's a, a, another spot of it, the 30 bus route and um, runs pretty frequently. At uh, 31 Southeast Street, we are gonna have uh, 14 on-site units, I mean, 14 parking I spots on-site. Um, and there's room for approximately 10 additional um, kind of parallel spots on the street here, 
as well as some additional um, parking off um, uh, down Southeast Street. So just, just I hate to interrupt you, but you got 10 spots out in front of your property. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So so from, from approximately right here, there's, you know, nine to 10 spots. And I know that um, we've had discussions with the town when they, um, you know, possibly when they do the upgrades to the street, there'd be a more formalized kind of striping pattern or, or, or something involved um, with that or, you know, potentially studying some sort of um, uh, more formalized parking. And then there's additional parking along uh, the street here. So, okay. yep. So with if you include the 10 spots, there'd be a parking ratio uh, uh, closer to, you know, 0.77. So, um, and uh, we looked at, and, and right here are the, uh, the bus stops. So we, we uh, you know, estimate that residents that don't have vehicles or don't have access to vehicles um, would, would have um, a good transportation choice with the either, um, you know, using the public transportation or just having a, you know, a short walk to downtown or, you know, hopping on a bicycle also, um, just down the road or just off the screen here is, uh, is, is a hub for one of the, um, like Valley bike shares. So, um, you know, what we found in our, in our parking memo was that, um, you know, there's, at, at, at some of our developments, there's, you know, a, de a decreased demand in parking, you know, from houses because they have limited access to cars. Um, there's, you know, availability of the on-street parking here. Um, and with the, you know, additional 10 kind of curbside spaces and then, you know, a, a total of a 20 or so on, on the street, there's there's room for kind of overflow parking on, on the street if need be. And um, the availability of the PVTA bus route, it you know provides regular daily service between Old Belcher Town Road and um, Puffton Village and Amherst Downtown um, and UMass Campus. So with the walking and the, uh, bicycling alternatives, alternatives, um, you know they're they're both walkable to the center of town and um, so you know we we feel that the the amount of parking here is 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 appropriate um, to meet the demands of the of the project. And um, another, you know, at Belcher Town Road, based on the the parking study, we um, worked with our engineer and um, decided that in lieu of a you know a large kind of drop off area here, we would um, reconfigure it. Um, slightly to gain six spaces that could be used as um, overflow overflow uh, parking. And I'm sorry, the, the screen is off to the side. Um, would you like to ask a question now? So, so the first thing is, um, what's, the, what's the status of your discussion with the town in terms of residential parking in um, on Southeast Street, having a residential parking sticker or something on Southeast Street. Is that, have you gone down that road? I know the town is very involved in the project and I wondered if, they, if there's any indication from the town to you or from perhaps the staff knows, if there's any indication of the town's uh, inclination and, and schedule if, if they are so inclined to have some kind of residential parking sticker available for residents on Southeast Street. I I, I can say that there has been discussions with staff about a more formalized scheme on the street, and they're looking into that in this area of town. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sloviter. On, on Southeast Street, does counting the 10 spots in front of the property imply that those spots are normally empty and therefore available to your property. I don't have a feel for what the normal parking situation is on that street. If yeah. it's already, if it's full a lot of the time, then 10 spots would not be available unless you uh, it's designated somehow by the town. 
So my understanding, um, you know, speaking with with staff is that this is unregulated parking. Um, the other uh, apartments or houses that are used as um, utilized as rental units um, are are sort of required to have their own kind of parking plan to provide the parking required um, for the units on on site as well. So um, and that um, due to you know the proximity to the bus station, the it's 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 unregulated. So somebody could come and park here during the day and use the bus and you know take it to campus or or, or something like that. I've been out there a handful of times and um, I I have seen you know, four to five cars uh, kind of parked on the street and, um, you know, whether or not that's a function of, you know, pe people finding it easier to park on the street in lieu of pulling into the driveway, that sort of thing. Um, those are all things that I've observed while, you know, being on site out there a few different times. So, um, but generally when I've been out there, this, this has been this has been clear pretty much from here to the okay. Um, okay. Okay. So you feel it's a, it's reasonable to include those ten spots in your total? Is that in right? The, in, in in the front of the building, yes. Yeah. In the, in okay. The front of the lot, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. I, I'd just like to reiterate the concern. I I go by there fairly frequently, and I believe uh, that the um students either from these houses or students who come and uh, find parking available and go and use the bus stop and go into town or go to the university. Uh, that that whole street very often has got a lot of cars on it. So I, if there can be anything worked out with the town where you can have a sticker like we do in the center of town to, for parking, it, it probably would be advantageous. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Prestrup, do we know if this is on the agenda, this subject is on the agenda for any of the town council's committees or for any of the other departments? Do we know if there's any action on that? Uh, I'm not I'm not aware of there being, um, the, of this having a space on the, the agenda of the town council. Nate Malloy may know more about this because he's been in touch with the um, building commissioner and others about this topic. And I know he's in the uh, attendees um, group, so he, and he may have some more information. But anyway, uh, I know it's a topic of discussion. The town is studying um, the whole of Southeast Street, including this little um, offshoot of Southeast Street to try to control traffic. And um, they have made a presentation to the town council, where they're going to make a presentation to town council about other ways of traffic calming along Southeast Street. And I know that there have been discussions about parking along that uh, western edge of the little um, auxiliary road or however you want to call it. But I don't think anything's been resolved yet, and I don't think it's on the town council agenda. So um, staff could certainly look into that more. And I see. Um... Mr. Malloy has his hand up, so perhaps he can give us uh, some additional information. Mr. Malloy? Sure. Am I, uh, can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, DPW is going to repave that street. We have block grant money program to replace water and sewer line there, uh, service connections, and then repave the street and keep it, you know, 22 to 24 feet wide for on street parking. Uh, the collector's office has no problem with it, uh, and police don't have a problem with it. It's part, it's, like, as Jamie said, it's it's basically free parking now. And so, you know, the the thought would be either the whole stretch of the street or a limited portion could be set aside as a resident only permit, like is done, um, you know, on parts of, on other streets in town near the downtown. Uh, I mean, I will say though, in terms of parking, and right now it's a half space per unit. And, you know, we see this as an opportunity to have multimodal transportation. It is close to a bus route. There's bike share. There's so many opportunities to get around without a car. And so oftentimes, you know, we're trying to promote promote this, uh, you know, having less pavement. Uh, we did require a lot on the site in terms of open space in the back. So the whole backfield is wetland. And so that can, can, cannot be used for parking. Right. So 
you know, we're, we're aware of, you know, the need to make sure that the parking on the street is available. And, and if it needs to be available for this resident, for the residents, we've talked about it and everyone seems fine with it. It just hasn't been formalized yet. Uh, but it's something everyone's, you know, agreed to by consensus and that could move forward. All right. Um, well, perhaps one of the things we can discuss later today is whether we should take a position with this town council and um, recommend that they provide um, for residential parking in that on that or some portion of that street, at least, if not all of it. Um, do you have a I didn't notice if there was a parking plan, a parking management plan on the application. I may have just missed it. I may not have seen it yet, but is there a parking management plan? Are you going to have stickers? Are you going to have, uh, assign parking spaces? How are you going to handle parking on your on your uh, property itself? And then if indeed you do get the residential parking, do you have an idea of how you have street on street residential parking? Do you have an idea how you identify those cars? Um, yeah, we talk about that and uh, we've we've discussed it um, being sort of a, a first come first serve for parking and uh, having assigned spots on the, you know, on the on the property as far as um, permit parking that would be also kind of first come first serve um, for, you know, the residents to apply that would have to be through yeah. the, the town so and then they would have to, you know, I don't think they would be able to assign spots for something yeah. like that but um so that's we would have you know assigned spots at our on 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 site parking so you assigned yeah. spots okay and have stickers or something like that to identify so people aren't coming in and parking there and walking over to the bus you'd have correct. some way of yes correct correct yeah and and we'll also management. have property management you know on site um you know at very you know various times um during the day to you know, I, I'm all for, I, I like the notion of, of trying to encourage, um, I like the notion of trying to encourage people to take public transit and bikes and walk. And it's great uh, where it works, but you don't know if you're a resident there, if you have a job or a place to be that's close to a bus line or close. To, it's, and regrettably, uh, people still use their cars. So that's one, one thing that I'm concerned about is that um, even, you know, even with, 10 spots on the street, you're looking still at uh, seven of seven out of 10 units would have uh, a parking parking availability four, four on site and, and 10 on the, on the street. So, I mean, uh, 14 on site and 10 on the street. So it is a, it, it's a concern to me, but um, I think maybe we can continue to work on with the town that'll ameliorate it a little, mitigate it a little bit, but it is a concern Yeah, because these folks have, be living there they've got they probably some well many of them will have jobs some will be going to school but i suspect most of them will have jobs of some sort and they'll need to get there and they may not be on a bus line. yeah and so, until we you know we still people still have to drive regrettably yeah and that's in and, and it's um it, it's one of the things that we looked at and we looked at you know some of our properties um and you know depending on where they're located and uh you know the mix of incomes and and, and things like that and um, mm -hmm. I know that we felt as a as a team that uh, the the lumber yard that we looked at, which has a, a parking utilization of of point six two spots, that's actually the office that I'm in right now. Um, and 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 we find that there's you know sufficient parking provided for the um, for the residents here um, for that. So that was one of the indicators that we um, you know would kind of look to that the point six two would be below right the point um, seven seven um ratio for parking provided okay um and then mr meadows and i think you asked last time about um electric charging stations mm -hmm. i i don't recall what the what the um answer was to that or if there was one uh was I, it, are there I, did. I asked about um, the last 40b we had had a number of electric charging stations that were required um i would assume that that's the case with this and that they would have to be in both locations Is... that's that's correct we have them at both locations uh i think we 
recognized that at one of the sites, I believe it was at nine, that we also needed to provide one at the accessible parking spaces. They were all at non-accessible spaces, so we'd need to add one to uh, the accessible spaces there too. Okay. All right. Any other questions regarding parking uh, at the Southeast Street site before we move over to the Belcher Town Road site? Okay. Um, can we get a map of the, the well, go ahead and, and talk about uh, Belcher Town Road parking, please. Um, so the Belcher Town Road, um, we, the in, in the plans that you saw submitted, were uh, we made a change um, to that this uh, large turnaround, which you know we felt that it was a nice amenity for the um, residents, but we elected to um, change that out um, to get six additional kind of overflow parking spaces here, and um, you know thought that we we may be able to sign one or two from say eight to eight p.m. as as sort of like fifteen minute drop off spots to. Um, make up for uh, the um, the kind of the drop off area, so you know it would leave a a few spots here, kind of closer to the building um, for for temporary parking during the day, and then could be utilized um, in the evening or as uh, overflow. So um, it increased the ratio here to um, one point uh, one spaces per unit, um, and uh, we felt at at this site there wasn't any on street parking. Um, or you know close by so we elected to 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 do that here so we have 47 units um and um 52 spaces with uh four accessible spaces so you move the accessible spaces much closer to the front door or to the door yeah mm -hmm. right. okay And uh, right. it's it's my understanding that the uh, it it's 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 pretty much it's very similar and in, impervious area as far as because of the um you know kind of the paved the paved portion here the in the paved area here it's so got it and then you'll you'll have you'll identify electric charging stations both in the accessible as well as other places on your final plan correct. That is correct, yes. All right. Any questions about the Belchertown Road parking? Okay, great. Um, let's, so I guess we can talk about uh, what we may do as, as a board um, later to, in, the, in the discussion later today. But, um, thanks for that. I think that was another question that we have from board members. Let's move on to the next topic. So is the uh, fence and, and shed yep. materials is, is, was the next topic. Yep. I, um, yep. I utilize the uh, Southeast street site. There's uh, no fencing proposed at the Belcher town road site, but at Southeast street, um, we we're looking to put in a, a a wood style six foot privacy fence, kind of similar to these um, photographs here along the along the property line. Uh, currently, there there's a um, an old chain link fence with all the kind of the the smaller trees growing or in, in saplings kind of growing through it. So those would those would um, that would come out and be replaced with this. Um, it looks like there'd be some plantings here and then the um, walkway that is provided so that you'd be able to access this this area in the in the rear in the future. Um, and then on the original plan, there were some other, you know, kind of fencing shown here and um, decided that that, you know, it would be. Um, it would be better if, if the, you know, it was just a four foot high fence that's there now chain link we would remove that um as part of you know because it was just it seemed as though as part of the old school um you know to help maybe maintain you know children or something like that within the area and thought that you know removing it would make it easier for maintenance and and just kind of upkeep of the area instead of having you know saplings and things like that go um you know growing up 
through it. So we decided to move it along the northern property line and in, in the rear of the property. Um, around the dumpsters, we would look to kind of match, uh, you know, the similar fence material um, and, and surround uh, the dumpsters here. I was able to reach out to the um, the neighbors and the abutters here, and um, they really liked the idea of just a kind of, you know, a very simple minimal fence, and it would help sort of just delineate the property line along um, this portion of the, that abuts and, and runs there along their property. Their property is, is, is pretty much in this area right, right here, and then you can't see it, but it would be their their houses here on Main Street. So um that's that's we'd propose some sort of you know split rail kind of wood wooden fence um in the rear of the property. And then um we would just be looking to you know purchase a a a wood prefabricated uh utility shed. This one it, it was it would be something very similar to this. I I I think we'd probably omit the the windows on this just to kind of so it would be very um you know just similar to this probably without the windows though just with the doors so just for storage of um you know shovels and 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 things like that for maintenance um people to 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 use okay and and um I can I can flip to the let's just see if anybody I don't have any questions anybody else have questions what's what are the plan? What plannings are you planning to put on the um, by the, uh, the privacy fence, the trees? Um, that I can look up. Bob, do you know? Have you just made a decision on those yet? Yes, let me, uh, I've got a, a planting plan. I can show you a lot of the plants are actually existing, but uh, Jamie, yeah. I have. Planting. But, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should do the planting plan after we do the parking. Let's, we'll do all the planting all together at once as opposed to doing it piecemeal that we can keep the topic. Um, okay. Just to this. That, but that's good to know. Thank you, Mr. Whitmer. Good. All right. Yeah. Any other questions for, uh, Southeast and uh, fence and shed material. Do you have uh, something to show us for Belchertown Road? Um, well, Belchertown Road would be, uh, you know, a similar shed and a similar dumpster enclosure to this. And I can show you where those are located here um, on the property. So those those would be, you know, that's where the shed is located. And then the dumpster enclosure is a slightly different configuration, but it would be uh, a similar material. In the wood, got it. And, and no, uh, no fencing because there's on this one, right? That's that's correct. Got it. Any questions about Belchertown Road? Okay. We we did add um, it as part of some of the uh, response to the um, the board's questions um, last last meeting um we did add some some plantings um to kind of help screen the dumpster enclosure as you pull into the property and um along the uh along the property line here and those are the uh ink berries that the yep. landscape architect okay mm -hmm. good um next we talked about uh snow storage and that was, there was there seem to be more property available to you at Belchertown Road than at uh, Southeast Street. And I know you had some um, site plans showing where snow storage would take place. Can you share those with us? Absolutely. Um, so I'll start with Belchertown Road. Uh, we have two different colors here, um, and I'll just zoom in a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see. The darker blue uh, and then the lighter blue. The darker blue is the primary snow storage area. So this is snow storage area we think is, you know, very readily accessible um, during a snowstorm. And then the secondary, we can definitely still use, um, but we're just, you know, using it as a reserve zone because there's some slightly more delicate plantings in that zone. Um, and then, you know, we are pretty conservative overall with these areas. We do think we can fit it in other areas on the site, but just want to be, you know, aware of tighter corners or plantings. Um, but overall, 
Uh, you can see we, we have about 5,300 square feet of uh, primary snow storage and then 2,300 of secondary. And then for snowstorm volumes, this comes out to, uh, for the primary snow storage area, it's about a 6.6 inch uh, snowstorm. Um, and then the secondary provides almost another three inches. Uh, so you're getting, you know, almost 10 inches of snow storage between the primary and secondary areas shown. Um, and again, that's a pretty conservative estimate. Um, you know, New Englanders are pretty crafty about getting snow in. So, you know, I think we can probably get a couple more inches in there if we needed to uh, before we had to start trucking it off site. Um, so, you know, overall, it'll, the site should handle, you know, pretty confidently uh, 10 inches, a, a 10 inch snowstorm um, before, you know, having to find some other areas. Uh, and then for the Southeast Street site, same scheme. So dark blue and light blue. Dark blue is the primary snow storage. Uh, light blue is the secondary. Uh, and you can see, you know, dark blue is mostly around the front and the sides and then some light blue in the back area that might be a little bit tougher to get to. But, you know, we, we think we can still get to it uh, if needed. Uh, for the actual storm size for this one, uh, the primary snow storage will get us about 6.2 inches. Um, and then the secondary, we actually have a bit more than on the other site. This is another 4.2 inches. Again, this puts us um, just about over, you know, 10 inches. Uh, you know, conservatively, um, if this is all coordinated with the planning plans right now. So, you know, if we were going to, you know, push it against some more delicate plantings or what have you, uh, we could easily get, you know, at least a few more inches uh, for the storm size for this site as well. Um, so, you know, pretty confidently um, over 10 inches for both sites, uh, which is a, you know, fairly large size storm, uh, especially with the way that winters have been going. So just help me out. How do you get, so you have a 10 inch storm. How do you get to that light colored um, secondary storage area in the back? How do you get the snow back there? Do you have a little um, a small cat, what do they call those little skim? Uh, so I'm not exactly sure uh, what wayfinders would actually be using for there. Um, you know, it might be a bobcat. Um, some of it might be some hand shoveling. Um, depending on the storm size, you know, typically, you know, ahead of time, if it's gonna be a big storm or not, you would actually start filling up those secondary areas in the back first um, during these larger storms and then go for the uh, primary areas after in these really large storms. So, you know, the primary areas would be the main storm during the uh, smaller storm, like storage area for the smaller storms. And then, you know, if you have a big storm coming secondary area first and then fill all the way out to the front using the primary um, as best as you can. Okay. All right. Other questions about um, other responses to the questions about snow storage, and then you will have a there will be a plan for removal in case we get 26 inches of snow. Right, your management plan will have something that contains the big blizzard uh, snow event, so that you'll be taking it off off property. Right. Correct. Yeah. Wayfinders uh, will be coordinating with, you know, contractors to, you know, store snow off site if needed um, during those larger blizzards. You'll have that in the, the management plan. Correct. Got it. Okay. All right. Other questions about snow? Okay. Um, this might be a good time. Was there other things that people wanted to talk about? Um, Craig, your point on the, or Mr. Meadows, your point on the, the uh, oil, oil storage. Do you, does anybody know if there's an, any oil, an old oil um, tank stored someplace? So we're not aware of any oil tanks on site, on either site. Um, additionally, there was the talk of a septic system, I believe. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, where that question uh, come from. I'm not aware of any existing septic systems. And I'm also, we're not proposing any uh, septic systems on either site. Uh, it'll be tied into the uh, the city's sanitary system. Me, the question was really uh, about, about anything that would be current. It's an old building. And the probability is that there was a septic system there. Gotcha. Somewhere. And the question is, you don't want to be surprised when you're doing some uh, landscaping work to find out that you, you encounter a septic system consisting of a number of old filled oil drums. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the oil tank. You know, over the years, there have been a whole variety of ways of dealing with oil tanks. 
you know, banding them in place, filling them with sand, uh, removing them. And uh, I just caution you to try and find out from the town if there was an oil tank, where it might have been, and if it was removed properly. And if gotcha. not, then the, ta the town probably should remove it. Yep, agreed. And we'll we'll look into that. Um, and then coordinate with the DW. Oh, yep. Coleman. Please yeah, do, Jamie. Let, let me. Uh, let, let me. Um, and uh, just to kind of uh, you know fill in the gaps, there is. Um, yeah, we're working with uh, O'Reilly, Talbot, and Oaken, who is our environmental engineer. We've done a, a phase one um, report on this that kind of went through all the historical records of um, uh, for the environmental site assessment. They did find records of a um, of a an underground tank at the school and um, and and thought that it had been removed. Um, however, um, we went out there to do additional geotechnical borings and to be on the safe side of things, they um, performed ground penetrating radar all around before they did the um, did the, the 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 soil borings. And um, what they did find is is that there is a uh, an underground tank there. So they um, they tested the the some of the soils around to determine if it you know was um, was leaking and what they found that there wasn't any evidence that it was um, leaking or anything like that. So there is there is an underground tank on the property, and um, there will be provisions for, to have that um, removed and and properly disposed of. Good to hear. Yeah, good. Um, Great. Chair Judge, can I just add that the town engineer confirmed there was no septic system on the property as well, um, and that it's just a significant amount of groundwater below the parking lot that was uncovered. But no septic system. Correct. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, those are two. That's good news on both accounts. It's not leaking any oil, but uh, oil. That's great. Okay. Um, were there other questions from last week that we sought answers for? I'm, I think that was it. This is, this might be a good place, Mr. Wagner, to talk about some of the change if, if there are changes to the landscaping. Um, but you want to? We just go through that real quickly. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, Jamie, I wonder if you could bring back up your your plan. There there wasn't much, and uh, we saw the the primary change in the plan there in front of the dumpsters. We talked about screening those dumpsters as you come down the driveway uh, off of Boucher Town Road. That the the, the um, dumpster and shed would be screened by some planting. So you can see that detail uh, image there in the in the larger green square. So the we've got uh, uh, you know a, a a row or a, a kind of constellation of uh, inkberry plants there that will screen that image as you're coming down or screen that uh, condition as you're coming down the driveway. The other thing that uh, we we still, I think, want to uh, pay a little attention to in terms of plantings is that area now that's been changed at the drop off. Uh, Jamie, your cursor, you could to the left of the handicapped spots there, we've got another area there. We're still talking about that and how we might plant that area as well. I know on, on the Belchertown's site, you're removing a lot of trees, many of them old and on their way out anyway, uh, and you're, you're planting them, you're, you're planting trees to replace them. Is that correct? That's correct. And what are the trees along that, right where that cursor is starting there and going up towards Belchertown Road? You're going to plant them along the property side and not in the, in the obviously not in the wetlands or the um, the area that's dark gray there where water would accumulate. Do you know what kind of trees you would plant to put there and how big they'll be? Yes, uh, I can uh, share. Let's see. Maybe if you'd let me share now, Jamie, you can get into the uh, planting plan itself. Okay. There we and go. We can zoom in a little bit. I think uh, you're you're talking about this zone here. Yeah, that's on there. That's right. So those those trees all along there. Um, those are the uh, the sweet gums, I believe, Bob. Yeah, the four. Uh, no, 
let's see, where is the tag on them? Uh, three LS and then three LT. So it's the sweet gum and the tulip trees. There we go. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Holman. And then the, the NS trees, that's the uh, Tupelo. Those are the ones down the median here in the parking. So um, both the bank of trees along here will cast over, over time as they, as they get larger, will provide some shading over the paving here. And these will also provide some shading here. So there's, there's an effort here to try to reduce uh, heat island effect in the parking area. And then are you, I, on the other side of the grade crosshatched area, are you planting back there too as well? Correct. Yeah. So the Conservation Commission was concerned about, um, you know, our edge versus, you know, the existing wetland area. So we wanted to put some sort of planted buffer in between those two zones. So we're planting um, uh, like a wetland meadow mix, but then also like a shrub and kind of uh, like slope stabilization uh, planting mix on that sloped area. Got it. And they're, I suppose, they're native, mostly native plants. Correct. Everything is native except um, there's a dogwood that is a modified native, so it's a hybrid of a native and a um, you know a more resilient species uh, cultivar. Okay. And the um, plantings on the opposite side of the parking lot, where there's a number of them, I guess that'd be the west side. There, are those going to be? What are they? Arborvitaes? Are they? I hope not. But what else would they be there? Uh, those are the. Uh, the juniper, the um, the like juniper plantings along that edge. All right. And what about on uh, Southeast Street? Yes, we can jump over that. Uh, let me share again. Oh, sorry. Uh, did I get that? Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So you were, you were asking earlier about the trees here. You can see a lot at the perimeter are existing trees uh, to remain. You know, there's there there are some that are, are pretty close. This this tree here uh, may be a challenge um, yeah. with uh, excavations for the foundations. We have no basement over here, so that's good. We're not going as deep, but it's still that's a pretty tight condition. Yeah, we're going to the, 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 the root system there. Yeah. Um, other 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 trees. Uh, we've got some uh, smaller trees across the front here. You can see we've got. Uh, let's see. That's a a QC, um, which is a, a scarlet oak. We've got a couple of uh, ACs. Again, that's a, that's a service berry. These two at the front. And then uh, all all three of these are the same. All three of those are the uh, are the uh, scarlet oak. And then along the the uh, side there, the cube whatever the QPs are. Yes. Looks like you've got QPs are a pin oak, a columnar. They're more columnar, so they're going to be a little narrower. And then we've got one tree here in our courtyard. Uh, it's a it's also a, a a CR, which is a that's a pink dogwood. That I think that's the one Coleman had described earlier. It's a Rutgers Cor pink dog. Correct. Yeah, that's the hybrid. Um, you know, local with the uh, resilient cultivar, just to make sure that lasts long. Um, in the soil here. Okay. Are there questions from any other board members about um, what we've seen in the planting or types of plants? Great. Okay. I guess I want to ask board members, was there anything else or staff, is there anything else that we asked for um, responses to our questions for this meeting? I'll just go back through the minutes. I don't think there was anything else. No, we covered it all. Oh, you know, um, we, were, we, did, we did have one. We did have one. And then so we're going to talk a little bit about your request for a residential bylaw waiver. I noticed that you had a, you wanted a bylaw residential rental bylaw waiver, and I, I think I was the guy that asked that. So, can you give it? Have you given that some thought about why you're requesting one, or why why you want a waiver from the residential bylaw? 
Um, yeah, um, the affordable housing is a is a uh, highly regulated um, industry where we're we're subject to meeting the um, you know regulations of state, federal, all sorts of um, you know inspections and, and criteria that we have to meet just to um, receive our funding sources and to keep them you know certified. So it it seems um, as that this rental bylaw may be intended for you know properties that maybe are sort of unregulated unregulated regulated to kind of bring them in and um ellen did you want to um hop in and yeah i'm just going to say that um yeah we just saw today that that was waiver was um crossed out and we i didn't know that we were going to be talking about it tonight but briefly uh when i talked to jamie about it i mean it also um is a costly requirement um, given the number of units. And so we haven't had a chance, but we did want to um, determine, you know, the cost that it would um, add up to and present that to you. Um, and, and as well as the other basis on which we felt that, um, you know, it would be um, reasonable to grant that waiver. So. So you have more. You can have more discussion on that. Yeah, we had a brief discussion internally, but we did want to present something more formally as to why we thought yeah. uh, we justify, you know, to justify the the request for that waiver. So. All right. Well, we'll have that on a topic to come back to. We, we can be prepared for next week response. to do that. So. Great. Thank you. Ms. Brestrup, I see your yes. hands up. Yes, um, Mr. Malloy had conversations with the building commissioner about this, and I was listening in. So we might want to ask Mr. Malloy, because I think the building commissioner thought that um, this should not, this waiver should not be granted. Um, so either we have Mr. Mora come back to the meeting next week, or maybe Mr. Malloy can enlighten us now. Mr. Malloy. Yeah, sure. So the building commissioner is, you know, we advised that the three waiver requests for the residential bylaw not be granted. And so, you know, we want the properties to apply every year, list the number of units, and we collect that information. And so for every comprehensive permit, we don't waive uh, that request. So the, uh, you know, it's information that we want to collect. And so, um, you know, at the time of application, if it's a cost burden, we can talk about it. But it's, you know, it's an online system. It's an automatic uh, automatic renewal after you do it the first time. And so it's not, you know, a hardship in terms of time or, or you know, effort. And so it's something that we would recommend not waiving just because it's, for us, it's information gathering. It's important to know, you know, number of rental properties, who the management person is uh, and have all that record, parking plans. And, you know, it's it, it can just be duplicative information from what's submitted as a part of the comprehensive permit, but the building commissioner has said pretty firmly he would not recommend waiving those. So I guess what I'd like to do is uh, come back next week if you're prepared to do it at that point, and if Mr. Moore can or or Nate uh, or Ms. Prestra, just into any of your staff can also provide the town's viewpoint there. Um, I'm I've been a big supporter of the residential rental registration program, and um, I'm I would I'm interested in hearing what your case is to get a waiver for that. Um, a lot, I mean, there's a lot of waivers that we have to grant. That was kind of in our discretion that we have to look at. And so um, come back next week. That would be, in our that would next be helpful. Meeting. Thank you. We can talk about that more. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. All right. Um, any other questions before we go to architecture from board members? All right. Let's. Let's explore the architecture of, of these buildings. This is the this is the fun part. Uh, you get to see the drawings and the uh, the imagination and how you're going to put this property to good use. So I'm interested in that. We all are. Very good. Well, we're we're excited to show it to you. Um, so allow me to share. We'll start uh, with uh, Belchertown Road. And. Uh, We've, we've seen some of this before when we talked about site design last time, so I, I won't spend too much time on, on some of the drawings we've already seen before, but 
as I think you know now, we've got we've got uh, 47 units here at Belchertown Road. Uh, you can see the site location here across from uh, uh, the uh, the other development, Colonial um, Gardens, I believe it is. Site plan that we looked at last time, uh, you can see its relationship to the wetlands here and the parking. We've seen that a few times now. And uh, just a, another look again briefly at the street elevation. Um, what's what's going on here to, to on each side, you know, it's, it's uh, just more of single family residential. But I'll remind you that uh, the building has been uh, set closer to the street in an effort to begin what the town has been uh, planning as a more of a town uh, kind of uh, center or village center and, and starting to establish uh, more of a, a presence on the street uh, for later developments that would come up. Image that we showed you last week of the proposed building uh, um, on Belchertown Road. We're going to get into the interior of the plan, but you can see how we've we've broken down the scale here so that there, there are different masses here, the use of material and massing. Uh, a somewhat more traditional look here with, with, uh, with gables, uh, dormers, um, an entry area. That entry area is one of the key parts of the design here, so it, it feels welcoming, even though uh, all the parkings in the back, we wanted the front of the building to, to read with a primary entry and to be have a, a feeling of welcoming people who, who may be walking there, who may be getting off the bus and uh, coming on into the, uh, to the building. What's the material on the outside? So the white, the gray, um, is it? Yeah, so that's, all, what is it? that's all. Uh, there's a combination of uh, board and batten and uh, collaborate siding, but it's all fiber cement siding. So it would be a, uh, uh, factory finished uh, fiber cement siding. Okay. Asphalt uh, shingle roof, um, and then we've got uh, we've got uh, our, our windows here that um, are uh, they they appear as, as as well. It'll be a combination of fixed uh, glazing with some awning or casement windows as well. I'll take you to the, the floor plan here. This is the first floor, and you can see how the units are organized in each wing. But I bring your attention to the uh, to the entry again. This is really the crossroads of the building and kind of the heart of the building. Uh, as, as people are going to come in from the front or from the parking area that's back here, they would enter into the building. So this area will be uh, the more social part of the building. People coming and going uh, in and out of the building, people coming down uh, to the, the community room that's located here just off of it. Might be that people also ride their bikes. So bikes can easily be uh, stored inside in a safe environment here at the front of the building. And then uh, people would then enter into the rest of the building. You'll see the elevators here, the bank of elevators, two elevators with stairs down the, uh, the hallway a bit. So there's a lot of coming and going in this, in this space. Uh, the community room has been located not only to be easily uh, visible uh, from the lobby here, but also to be able to spill out into the patio area, the courtyard that's back here as well. And this is a kind of a key area, I think, for the residents, not only because it provides them outdoor space, but it also gives uh, a view to what are the, the wetlands, which are the really a resource and part of the natural beauty of this site. And you see we've got double loaded corridors here, a mix of uh, one, two, and three bedrooms. There are a couple studios uh, on the upper floors, but primarily it's a it's a, a mix of one, twos, and threes. The other uh, staircase is down at the end here of, of this um, of this corridor. Where we can, we try to keep uh, daylight on the corridor. So this longer corridor here has daylight at the end, which I think is a, is a real asset. Um, the shorter ones, we're, we're not uh, able to do that, but they are shorter runs. So I think it makes them a little more uh, livable in that sense. So can you give us what the colors represent? What are they two, are the purples two bedrooms? Let us yes, the, the purple, exactly. That. Yes, thank you. The purples are two bedroom units. The, uh, this, this lighter blue are one bedroom units. And then you'll see here the, the, the lighter purple in our three bedroom units. Okay. And then the gray is, are those 
studios or are those mechanicals? Those are mechanicals. Those are mechanical electrical rooms uh, that we've got some storage as well. Uh, we've got a water room here. And uh, yeah, I could um, zoom in a little bit. That helps, that helps a lot. Yeah. My eyes aren't good enough to read that. Well, mine, mine aren't either. Yes. <laughs> You can see the maintenance mechanical here is in the water fire protection room on the front. So when we get the uh, water coming from the street here, it's not too far to get to the to the water room. You can also see that there's uh, there's common laundry back here in a, in a small meeting room uh, that uh, have access to these toilets that will serve not only people using the meeting room or laundry, but also be accessible for people having functions in the meeting room. Okay, so laundry. Laundry is not an each individual unit, but is a, a common laundry. That's correct. All right, Mr. White, I see your hands up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Wagner, uh, just for kind of my own visualization, where uh, on this map approximately our drawing uh, is the house that, like when we did the site visit, is you know set back up into the driveway. Clearly, obviously, it's towards the very rear of the. Probably, yeah. But. Um. Sorry. Let me get to the other drawing and see if we can uh, see it more readily here. You're, are you talking about the uh, the buildings that are going to be demolished, or are you talking about the neighbors? No, I'm not speaking about the neighbors. Uh, currently on this property, you know, if you take the driveway, you know, which obviously this whole area is under construction right now, but uh, there is a home. Is the the house? kind of where the parking lot is now it is it's where whoever do okay. that's right it's approximately where that red box is yes okay thank you might be a little bit closer to the street but you're you're pretty much uh in, in the general vicinity excellent thanks okay so uh back to the the floor plan then you could you can uh see the relationship of all these common areas in, in the center of the uh of the first floor, as well as the, the mail room here that's off the lot. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention there's, there is a little kitchenette. So if there are any kind of uh, um, building wide uh, gatherings here, there's there's opportunities for food to happen as well. I see you have a package room. Um, and so that Amazon or other delivery will be, people will be able to have access and put their packages in there. Okay. That's Correct. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's a recognition by wayfinders that uh, or a desire by wayfinders to in their in their developments to to really uh, create community and and we we know from experience that to, to create community you need to give people spaces to gather so there's been an effort here to make those kinds of interior spaces the community room as well as exterior spaces this courtyard for residents here to gather and get to know one another. Got it. Then we can go uh, upstairs, the second floor. It's um, pretty similar. Uh, uh, we've got uh, we've got the the color coded units. Then the uh, three bedrooms, uh, uh, two bedrooms, and and one bedroom. This this uh, pinkish building is the studio. There's a one studio on the uh, second floor and one on the third floor, and then the gray spaces again are are more utilitarian, mechanical, electrical rooms. The elevator lobby is really the center here. So when people get off, uh, we've created a space here that gets natural lighting and there'll be views out to the courtyard in that elevator lobby as you're waiting um, for the cab to come. And then as we go to the top floor, uh, there's, there's really more of the same. There's some space here uh, that's because of the roof lines, it's, it's um, it, there is some space under this, but these are roof trusses, and this is not uh, considered to be habitable space. That's why you see these two larger gray areas here. And the rest of the units pretty much stack. Uh, egress stair over here and egress stair at this end of the building. Then we'll go to the roof plan, which is which is somewhat interesting. You you saw what- Oh, Mr. Mr. Slobodar, I just saw your hand up. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. It, I just put it up a moment ago. The laundry room with four washers and four dryers is on the first floor. And uh, unless I missed it, it serves the entire building. Is that correct? There's no 
no community laundry facility anywhere else in the building. That is correct. Uh, is that considered adequate for machines for this many units? Yes. Um, I'm thinking we are at, at 47. I think that's a really good question. I think we should double check that. Uh, if, if memory serves, it might be one setup for 10 units, which would make us one short, but we should, we should verify that. Okay. I'm okay. 47 units can generate a lot of laundry, I would think. Um, and everything on the third floor has to come down to the first floor. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Is there an ability to add some on the common wall of the meeting room if you did make a decision that you need more? I think there is, and there's there's quite a bit of Our space. Room. I think we could even bank some on this side and still get yeah. at least five feet between to make sure that it's fully accessible as well. Tables, bowls, and stuff um, like that. And there, uh, I think someone uh, heard somebody just mention they're all they're also the possibility of stackable units. Um, yeah. That doesn't yeah. work so well for uh, more yeah. heavy duty commercial. Um, yeah. equipment, uh, especially for washing machines, but some dryers uh, are capable of stacking all right. Is is there any possibility of perhaps splitting it up or adding two machines or something on the third floor so that there's not as much household activity like laundry on the elevators coming down all the time? We could explore that. Uh, there, are, there are areas, I think, um, some of these these gray spaces could be studied uh, to provide that. Uh, if we if we if it turns out we don't need quite as big of an electrical room, or we could look at some of these trust spaces yeah, the to see if we can get maybe some the of front. the yeah, or maybe the uh, the hall side of the trust space might be high enough to allow some. Yes, use, and you got a plum for it and everything else, but that might be a good possibility. That that that's something we could study some more, and it uh, you know there is plumbing below on the second floor yeah. in this zone already, so it would tie into those stacks. So before you leave, just for my information, where do you get the standard ten to um, ten to each uh, dry, washer dryer, ten units to a washer dryer? Is that um, industry standard, or is it some government uh, standard that's set? Where does I that come believe. from? I believe that, and I'm not sure that my ratio is quite right, but uh, from the sanitary code, the state sanitary code. State sanitary code, okay. All right. Okay, we'll, we'll move to the, uh, to the roof plan here. Um, as we saw from the rendering, we've got a lot of uh, sloped roofs or pitched roofs all around the, the perimeter, as it, particularly as it faces the, uh, the street here. But then, as you get toward the, the back of the building, we have a lot of flat roof. And that's, that's intentional. It's, it's, uh, it's to provide uh, areas for um, mechanical equipment, uh, as well as give us an area for more uh, solar arrays that can be easily uh, mounted there. So we're going to see that in the elevations, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what that looks like um, on the roof plan. So here are the elevations of the building. Uh, we saw this in the, in the rendering where we've got the, the, the gabled uh, bays across the front, three of those, and then a, uh, an end gabled volume here. Entry is located right here. Uh, siding, we talked about the fiber cement, but we're, we're looking at uh, a different colors. This isn't a final necessarily on colors, but we're, we're trying to show some indication of of tone at least and changing from dark to light and some contrast between the different areas. Mm -hmm. Then as we get to the back of the building, the courtyard side, we're also giving uh, some special attention to the entry area. This is the community room that we saw and then the entrance into the lobby is right here. So we're thinking that those two entry areas uh, might be a different kind of cladding that uh, uh, be more wood-like, provide a little bit of warmth and a little more detail to those areas where people are coming in and out uh, all day long. Yeah. And you switch the orientation of the siding from vertical to horizontal. And we did, we did. So 
This is slightly slightly more contemporary with the flat roofs that we we saw on the roof plan, but we're we're giving some uh, significance or identification here to the area that's uh, around the entry. So people parking will will come up through the courtyard and toward this entry, but still maintaining some of the uh, the same look that's on the front with the gable ends here, and also uh, that that same look on this other volume, the other wing of the building. Okay. Then as you start to look at the other sides, we'll see this uh, This is the driveway side. So as you're coming down that driveway, this is uh, Belchertown Road over here. As you're coming down, this is the view that you would have. And then on the opposite side of the building, facing the abutter, this is the view that you have there. And that's, um, uh, again, using some of the more traditional board and bat and, and uh, collaborative siding. We've shown a couple of uh, building sections here. This this one, this is the courtyard side, or I'm sorry, no, this is actually the, the, the Belchertown Road side. As you come in the entry, you can see this is the lobby area that uh, goes all the way through the building to the courtyard side that's over here on the right. And it, this also gives you a little bit of a sense of how the roofs work. Here's the pitched roof that we saw from the uh, Belchertown Road side, and it comes back down and then turns into a flat roof where our solar arrays will be mounted and mechanical equipment uh, when when needed will also uh, live on that, that flat portion of the roof. Hmm. Then we've got some, uh, a few images here, uh, just three dimensional ones. This is similar to the one we've seen from the front. Uh, this is kind of a straight on elevation again from the front. The one down here in the lower left is a more aerial, but lets you see how the roof is working more in three dimensions with the pitched roofs and the flat roofs. And then this is a view finally at the courtyard from the parking lot. I'm happy to zoom in on any one of those if that would help. And then lastly, uh, we just end with the uh, the image as you'd see it from Belchertown Road. Help me again where the closest bus stop is. Is it across the street and into the other development or is it on Belchertown Road close by? The uh, the bus stop, I believe, is in the development uh, across the street. And yeah. we've, we've coordinated a, a walkway here um, from that side so that people get dropped off can uh, uh, crossover, and I believe this is that walkway is a part of the new work that's ongoing on the site right now. I don't know if uh, if the town can confirm that for us. And maybe Nate, do you know if that's going to have the flash, the um, actuated flashers that we have, like on on uh, Amity Street and down by Amherst College? Yeah, the plan is to put um, you know a new crosswalk with you know, RFBs, rapid flashing beacons for crosswalk. Yeah. And the, the, the bus stop will remain at Colonial Village. So there was discussion about trying to put it, you know, on Route 9, but it's too narrow. And so there will still be a bus stop going either direction at the entrance to Colonial Village. So you just have to walk out the front door, cross the street, and then it's just right, you know, right across the street. Yeah, and the flashers are there for... Yep, for yep. The, the flashers will be there. Yep. Good. Okay. Just thinking, any other questions about the architectural side? Do you have any uh, in the, uh, I, the, uh, the exterior architecture and the layouts of the, of the rooms or the apartments, I think look very good. Um, I like the notion that maybe that you, if you can explore the possibility of more laundry, of, of more robust laundry facilities or maybe additional facilities upstairs in some of the truck, those uh, unused spaces on the third floor. I know that takes some work to and re-engineering to do, so that might take some time, but that'd be something that would be of interest, I'm sure, to many people. Ten, you know, one a washer dryer for 10 units uh, can be, especially if you've got working families who only have four or five hours a night to do the laundry, it could be, it gets pretty, uh, it could get to be a lot of demand. But um, that would be something I'd be interested in seeing um, more work done on if that's possible. And then I, is there, do you have any kind of um, 
um, images for the interior of the apartments. Have you got far enough on that that there's any way to show us what you're envisioning for what these apartments would be like on the interior finishes? We haven't. Um, I mean, but but typically uh, we'll be looking um, primarily at uh, painted sheetrock for the walls. Uh, often we, we would have a, a luxury vinyl plank for flooring. Um, you know, the cabinets often uh, are, are wood cabinets. Sometimes we've done laminate cabinets as well. Uh, and then um, we've got, we're going to have to look at uh, budget, but uh, there's uh, often we'll, we'll try to do a little bit uh, more robust or more durable countertops in the kitchen if, if the budget can afford it. Um, sometimes we've had to go with plastic laminate when we can't afford it, but uh, it seems like more and more we've had a good a good chance to incorporate either granite or some kind of quartz uh, for the uh, for the countertops. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah, Ms. Brett, I see your hand is up. Yeah, um, while we're looking at this image, I would just wanted to say that the planning board um, had a presentation about this project oh. from um, Mr. Gruber and also from, um, I believe his name is Paul Ehrlich. Um, from Wayfinders. In any event, um, the planning board was very pleased with um, the changes to the architecture and felt that um, Wayfinders was really responsive to the comments that the planning board had initially, and they felt that um, the image of this building is really in keeping with, you know, the architecture that we like to have in Amherst. And Nate and I, or probably Nate, will put together a letter summarizing their um, comments, but I think overall they were very pleased and uh, particularly with the changes to this building. So I just wanted to add that while we're looking at this building. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And if, it, if there's anything else that you need to report from um, the meeting, the planning board meeting, uh, we can do that after the presentation if there's anything else. Great. Okay, uh, questions regarding the exterior or suggestions for that you'd like Wayfinders to look at for the interiors? The board members. Okay. I, uh, I share the, what appears to be the, the um, opinion of the planning board, although it's not as much our jurisdiction, but I think the, the exterior representations that we've seen look pretty nice. And um, the one thing that's important to me is that this kind of housing look good. And I think people like to keep that kind of housing in good condition when they get, when there is good, good housing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you, it looks to me like you've gone out of your way to try to create a, a good contemporary looking building with some more historic features that kind of fit with the town's uh, history and what a lot of the, the these structures are currently like, but it looks to me like it's very well, well planned and attractive. I mean, it looks to me to be a very attractive, and that's all mine. That's my opinion. It's not worth anything, but it's just what I, what I see. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's our goal too. We 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 feel strongly about good design uh, for uh, for these projects for affordable yeah. housing projects. Yep, yeah, I think we don't have to sacrifice design for that. That's right. Um, Chairman Judge, I'm wondering. Uh, I know we're ahead. at the other site, but would you like to look, or would the would the um, board like to look at the mechanical electrical side of things on this site while we're here, or do those? You know what we're going to do? We're going to give ourselves a chance to think about that while we take our five minute break, which comes up right at right at seven thirty. We can take a five minute break. My preference would be that we stay on that site and do the uh, the mechanicals, and then move to southeast. But if, I think that would make the most sense. But if um, people have a different thought, good. I'll see you all at seven thirty-five. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. All right. I'm back. I know Mr. Meadows has been back on. Mr. Slobod is on. Mr. White is, I know he's listening in. I, I'm yep. here. Yep. All right. Um, Mr. Wagner, we can go over the mechanicals for um, Belchertown Road, if you'd like. I think we got most of the other people coming in. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, mechanical engineer, Anthony Gray, and then following Anthony, uh, we'll be asking uh, Scott Hoadley to also um, let you know a little bit about the electrical design for the for the building at uh, Belchertown Road. Great. Mr. Gray, right. go ahead. Thank, thank you, everyone. Good evening. Let me share my screen. I, it's a little bit of a tough act to follow with Bob's fancy drawings and views, but mine will be 2D and more discussion on the system from an overarching standpoint. So pull up my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes. All right. Bunch of stuff on there. All right. So HVAC wise, um, we can discuss this as the most impactful mechanical system on the project in terms of space and uh, flexibility also in terms of design. So what we have here at this building, we have a multi-zone air source heat pump system, all electric heating and cooling. And there's one system that does both um, with the outdoor heat pump on the roof, located on the roof. And then we have the indoor units that are dispersed in all the apartments. These units are ducted, so we're routing ductwork to each of the rooms within the unit. Also, that ductwork, you know, so for AHU, the AHUs that we have on the project, those are doing the heating and cooling for the unit, but we also have a separate unit that does ventilation air. So ventilation air supply, and then we also have extract or exhaust air coming from each apartment. Also have, just going back to the, the laundry room, the laundry room is its own zone on its own. So we have a makeup air ventilator that supplies the laundry room. Um, and then the dryers are being exhausted separately independently. So our energy recovery system that does the entire building. So this system, this heat pump system relies on refrigerant as the main heat transfer medium that gets piped throughout the building to all the indoor units. They supply the heating and cooling through the air handlers that we have in the spaces. That's sort of an overview of the HVAC system. I do want to go quickly to the roof plan. I mean, each floor pretty much has, a, has similar layouts and we've done typical layouts for the typical apartment types that we have in this project. So just getting to the roof, we have all of our equipment on the roof. We don't have any equipment that's mounted at grade. Everything here is on the roof. So we have our individual heat pumps that do our electric rooms and our one-to-one -one split systems. And then we have our multi-zone heat pumps that are HP1 and HP2 that are shown here. And then we have our building ERV systems that are doing the fresh air supply and the exhaust air, exhaust or extract air from the building. All of that located on this part of the roof to stay clear of the other parts of the roof that will be for solar. 
And I do have some pictures of this equipment where Kashi said we wanted to show so that you guys can get an idea of what that looks like. So here's one of the systems. So this would be what HP1 looks like on the roof. And it has two modules that are installed side by side on the roof. And then HP2 is the same actually for this project. So all together, we have 44 tons of heating and cooling for this building. Ventilation here. This is the ventilation. This is the ventilation area unit that we're. We have two of these for this project, for this building in particular, and it's mounted on this roof on, on the roof on a roof curb, and the air is distributed through the building to the individual apartments. That looks like. I want to pull up the plumbing drawing quickly just so that we can get it over. Before we go into plumbing, um, so you say you have 44 tons of um, HVAC power. I'm not even sure how to. How yeah, to capacity, HVAC. Capacity. Yeah. Uh, um, and with the, um, the air pumps, at times people worry about whether they provide sufficient warmth when it gets cold and there and i know some people have um supplemental heating electric heating when they have a, an air pump is are these air pumps sufficiently robust to provide um, heat when it's 10 degrees below zero or is at zero or are you have, are you looking at do you have a, a, a supplemental system that kicks in yeah these systems are termed and coined the Mitsubishi Hyperheat System. This is our basis of design that we're designing the project around. And these systems can provide 95% of the heating capacity. If they go down to, okay, here we go. If they go down to negative 10, negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Jeremy, I also, I neglected to mention that uh, both of these buildings are being designed uh, to passive house standards, which means that they uh, not only, um, they have a very robust uh, envelope, the insulation around the building is, is robust, but there's, a, there's um, strict air tightness standards as well. So what that ends up meaning is that not only is the equipment able to be sized smaller or more appropriately to the to the needs of those spaces, but that you don't have the, you know, kind of the, the cold drafts that you might have uh, in, in other buildings. And you don't have the thermal bridging that sometimes uh, makes spaces cooler as well. So the, the passive house standards that we're, we're meeting are also going to provide for, uh, for this comfort during both the heating and cooling season. Okay. Well, it's, it's a new build, so you're not... For more, much, much of it's a new build, so you're not trying to put this into a, a leaky old house. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about the HVA systems? Okay. Uh, I don't see any. Oh, Ms. Brestrup, I see your hands up. Um, my. My only question is if Mr. Gray would at some point or one of your one of you at some point would show us what can you see from the site? Can you see any of this equipment from the site or from elsewhere? Um, that's, you know, and if you don't want to do that now, maybe later in, in your presentation, you could do that. Sure, I can uh, dis discuss it and walk through that. So this equipment is located on this, this portion of the roof over here, which is you know the front of the building 
it's down here. I don't have the site plan available, but the front of the building is over here. And then we have a gable or a ridge, shall I say, in, in the middle high point of the roof that you can see from the front of the building. So I don't think that these units will be visible from the front of the building. Um, from the side, you know, if a car is over here or if someone's down here, um, I think they're, you know, in, in the drawing or in one of the renderings that we were looking at, there's some foliage and trees over here. So I'm not sure that you'll be able to see this equipment from the, from the front of the building, you won't be able to see it, but from the side, potential. Bob, you may be able to chime in on that with what's located on the side of the building. I think you're right, Anthony. And we could, uh, we could actually uh, take those, just make a, a simple volume for those, that equipment, you know, both just, you know, in height and width and all, and, and place them on the roof and then uh, um, send you some images, both from the street uh, and also from the parking lot to see, are they visible from the parking lot? You know, we can give you different views of of uh, where it might be visible and, and even, I. I I think the Anthony's right. I don't think you're going to be able to see this uh, at all from the from Belchertown Road, but uh, I I can't say that with full confidence yet about from the parking lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be helpful just to to know it, how visible they are. Because yeah, that'd be a good idea if you could do that, Mr. Okay. White. Yeah, I think it's going to be tough to see a lot of them because they're going to be up over three stories high, and the, aside from the the. Uh, the, the walkway or the entranceway there, they're pretty much removed. So there's a, you know, be, you'd have to be up kind of high to see them. But that's right. Yeah, it'd be good for you to show us that. Okay. Happy to do it. Okay. Any, any other questions on the APAC here? Right. Switch quickly. Plumbing. Okay. No more. Go ahead. Go on to plumbing. Okay, so let's see. It's the slab sanitary. So on this building, this obviously I think we discussed and we all know that this is a slab on grade building. So we're not we don't require any sewage ejector or pumping of any waste up through the building, with the exception of the elevator sump pump that's required by code. Um, so we put that in the elevator, pump, pump that up, put it in an oil water separator, and then connect that to the sanitary system that drains by gravity to the uh, Mr. Gray, sewer. you're kind of breaking up. Can you speak a little louder? I'm catching most of your words, but not all. OK, sorry about that. So. Yeah. Yes, the sanitary system here is a gravity system um, with the building being a slab on grade building, no basement here. And the only pump that we will have is for the elevator sump pump that's required by code. Um, so that will be pumped up, placed, that, the pump will be placed in the elevator pit um, and then pumped up, will intercept any oil or or sand that gets pumped out of there in the water stream, and then we'll send that to the sanitary system that drains by gravity. Um, so that's an overview of the sanitary drainage system. For the storm drainage system, um, again, we're connecting to the storm outside underground at the locations that we coordinated with civil for picking up the stormwater runoff from the roof. Anthony, what about the hot water? Sure, yep, we'll do that. So the hot water system here is another air source heat pump system. Um, we have our hot water tanks that will be in this mechanical room. Um, these are the hot water storage tanks. And then we also have a supplemental electric resistance heater that will boost the temperature when the heat pump 
cannot create the proper temperature for the hot water storage. So that system is also, or the outdoor unit is also located on that roof that we were just looking at. That equipment is here and it's uh, that as well that I can show. That it looks similar to the other heat pumps. Um, it's another uh, Mitsubishi electric product and it has a similar look as the other heat pumps. So you're, you're using tanks for hot water as opposed to on demand heat? Yes, we're using tanks because, you know, we want to utilize the, the heat pump, the, yeah, the air source heat pump system. If we used on demand all electric, we wouldn't be able to utilize that feature at this time. I'm not aware of any on demand heat pump electric. Do you have any natural gas going into this building at all, or is it all electric? All electric, no, no gas to the building. So similarly, this heat pump can operate down, down to negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit, but it has a much significant reduction in capacity as compared to the HVAC heat pump. These are a newer product um, that's available for multifamily housing specifically, and we are using this design on other projects as well and have success with it. Okay. Else on floor plan. Oh, yeah. The the fixtures, um, you know, for for the fixtures we're using. I think. Yeah. So for all of the fixtures, we're using water sense fixtures with low flow low flow rates for the water closets, the lavatory sinks and the showers. Um, so that's also a water conservation measure there that we have on the project. Any questions on the plumbing system? How many bathrooms are in a three bedroom? Are there two? I think we only have one, one bathroom per unit. Okay. Uh, three bedroom would have uh, one and a half and have a full bath and a half bath. Okay. So, but, okay. One and a half. And for the two bedrooms, it's one bathroom? Correct. Okay. And you, you, know Bob, I did. you know who you're specking for the toilets? Usually we go with Kohler. Or residential. That's our basis of design. Yeah. But it is a water sense fixture, correct, Anthony? Yes. Yep. Water sense rated. That's a, a rating for uh, you know efficient water consumption. Exactly. Yeah, there are some. There are a number of point eights out now that are a little more efficient than that. Right. Yes. That's the the stealth uh, water closet. Yeah. with that as well. And does not, I think Niagara might have one. That's yes, yes. Niagara. Yep, yeah. Niagara. Okay. Um, do you have sprinkler that I can quickly walk through? I don't know, does, does the board, uh, would they like to see a sprinkler design? I'm assuming that you have a sprinkler in every room of the yeah. building. It is, is that correct? It's fully, fully correct. Sprinkler. Yes, yes, fully sprinkler building. Yeah, I I don't need to see a design of that unless other board members do. But and it's you know it, it has to comply. It has to comply with the town's requir requirements and the town's building code. So I'm sure you do. Yep. Okay. Um, so I can turn it over to Scott. He can discuss the electrical system. Okay. Let me uh, share a screen here.
I think that's correct. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. So electrical, I just I think we'll start um going through the electrical system. We'll start at the site and uh work our way into the building from there. So currently, right now, the proposed location for the pad mount transformer is in this corner of the building. Um primary we're at this point, we're proposing coming off a pole, coming across the street and uh, feeding the transformer. But we have a meeting scheduled right now with Eversource on Monday to kind of go over some of those details. So a lot of the stuff on the primary side is probably going to change. So um, from the transformer, we'll extend and go into the building's main electric room where there's a 3000 amp service uh, in that main electric room. And uh, that's going to be used to supply power to both the unit loads and the house power loads. Uh, on the site, we have some site lighting locations along the edge. Uh, I apologize, this site plan is a little bit outdated compared to what we were looking at earlier. Um, but from an electrical perspective, this is kind of what we're proposing on doing. We're going to provide some lighting around the parking lot, um, some shorter lighting like bollards uh, around the walking areas, uh, there was a question earlier about EV charging. Currently, we have four dual head EV charging proposed uh, to be active on day one, and then there's a future for two more. We're going to have to add an additional one for the handicap accessible parking uh, over here. So I think that pretty much kind of covers what we're doing on the site. Uh, unfortunately, this transformer it needs to be accessible from the street, truck accessible from an Eversource perspective. So we're fairly limited as to where we can put it, uh, unless we wouldn't have chosen to put it kind of out in the front of the building. Um, this building is going to be set up for future PV. There's zones on the roof, as you've seen in, in some of the earlier slides. So that PV disconnect switch will be mounted out here by the transformer. If that's what's proposed at the moment. So, but the PV is not going to be installed on day one. We're just putting the provisions, the condos, the infrastructure in for it. So, moving into the building, uh, this is the power distribution. We have some panel boards that we're going to have. Each unit will have its own panel. Um, as far as lighting, interior lighting goes, for the common areas, we're going to use LED lighting to be energy efficient. We're going to have uh, motion sensor control that will dim the lights down to a 50% level when there's no activity. Um, you'll have some light, so you'll have, you know, even if the system stopped working, you'll have enough light to get out of the building. The halls won't appear dark, but you'll get some energy savings uh, for the for the dimming. The uh, stairwells will drop those lights down to 30% on motion. They'll be lit all the time. But uh, when someone enters a stairwell and starts to walk down the stairwell, they'll they'll jump up to 100%. So each of the floors are kind of the same with respect to the lighting, um, common area lighting. So keep moving through. I kind of want to get to the units. Inside the units, you know, typical unit, uh, there again, that lighting, each room will have a ceiling-mounted light. It'll, all the lighting in the units will be LED. We're going to provide uh, manual dimming controls in the units, not automatic, so that uh, like you can dim the lights up and down, like the bedrooms or the the common areas. Bathrooms will be just be on and off, like a typical bathroom, and same with kitchens. Now, um, might as well talk a little bit about power. You know, we've laid the receptacle like locations out per the code, 12 foot on center spacings uh, as required. Uh, the kitchens are covering the, the counters. You know, every four foot of counter is going to have a receptacle. Uh, and we've provided power for the uh, standard appliances. You know, there'll be emergency call systems in the elevator lobbies. Moving on to fire alarm. Uh, fire alarm system where there's no fossil fuels in the building, CO detection is not required. Uh, the system will be based upon a complete system 
all the devices in the uh, in the building will be system connected devices instead of the regular 120 volts that you would normally have in your units, like you have in a lot of houses. Um, those those uh, devices will be equipped with sounder bases, and I think when we had the meeting with the fire department initially, they requested alarm verification as well. So, when the uh, unit, if someone burns the toast or something like that in the kitchen, you know this will sound first in the um, at the sounder base. You'll hear the tone, and then if a second alarm goes off or if it sounds for so long, then it'll put the building into general alarm. And uh, it will it will transmit to the fire department as supervisory, so the fire department will be aware that there's an issue, um, but it won't evacuate the building until that second device kicks in. So, so I mean, as far as the electrical goes, I think that's pretty much covers all the systems. Um, does anybody have any questions? Cable and internet. So cable will come in from the street. Let's uh, we can go back to the same plan. But each unit, each unit will have? Yes. A cable access and internet access to the cable? Yeah, so they'll, it'll come in from the street into the main IDF room. Um, actually, I could probably find my riser. Might be the. You know, I don't need to know where it is. I just need to know that each unit has cable and, and uh, Internet. Yes, it will. Okay. So. Mr. Sloboder, I see you had your hand up for a second. Yes, but then you asked my question for me, so that was very thoughtful of you. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to save your, you know, save your voice. I, 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 it's appreciated. All right. Scott, is there anything else that you uh, wish to review with us on electric for Belcher, for uh, Belcher Town Road? So I, th I think that's it for right now. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a meeting planned um, to meet with the electric utility on site on Monday. We're gonna verify transformer locations and some of the other aspects um, with respect to the service and what the requirements are gonna be. Um, and so, you know, once we get feedback from the electric utility company, then we'll probably end up having to make some revisions to these drops, but until then. Okay. One question I have is when will we see cut sheets on the bollards and the um, the parking lot lights? So I believe the parking lot lights um, that was submitted in the package. Am I speaking yeah, to you, right. Andrew? Got yeah, hi. Um, that's right, yes sir. Uh, um, the uh, site lighting uh, sheets are in the civil package, civil landscape package. Um, we are, um, uh, we've found a few uh, uh, errors in the, um, in the cut sheets, but overall the cut sheets show kind of like the style uh, of the, of the fixtures. Would you like me to share that, Andrew? Sure. Okay. I think so. The photometric yeah. analysis that was done by a uh, our lighting um, consultant, uh, Boston Light Source. That's the photometric. All right. Yes, and you can see here. This is kind of the baller type fixture. You know, they're about twenty four inches in height. Oh. Um, and then the uh, the lumen blade is the bigger fixture that will be used in the parking lot. And is this in our packet of um, material, of the binder that we received? I believe so. Jamie would probably be able to uh, answer that directly, but it's um, it's in between the civil drawings and the landscape drawings. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. But you do have a full voltage study. All right. Yeah, that should be in uh, exhibits uh, six. Like six A and in or or exhibit six. A and six um, B for right. architectural segments. Good, I can look that up. Thank you. And I, I have not uh, finished my fixture selection for the interior yet. So right now I just have placeholders in there um, to get performance and that's about it. So I don't have any cut sheets to share with you on that. 
Okay. We'll be working with our interior designer too on, on I think, on some of the uh, fixture selection. All right. I'd also want to mention that uh, some of the bollards we've we've learned uh, are actually going to be more pedestrian scaled pole mounted lights uh, because of the the need for uh, greater lighting levels along the drive. Uh, I believe they're they're ten foot. Is that right, Andrew? That's right. Um, we originally wanted uh, bollards, um, but um, that's right. They're so they're called on the on the drawings here. They're called LB for light bollard. You know, uh, shorthand, but they're actually going to be ten foot tall. So um, we we were asking our uh, lighting consultant to just you know um, rename them like L uh, LP one and LP two for light pole, and those will shine away from the building, so they won't be intruding on in somebody's living room and bedroom. That's correct. There's uh, okay. these are uh, dark sky compliant, um, and they will not spill either onto the and in, um, into the neighbors' properties or uh, right into uh, the units. Got it. Okay. Well, I have no other questions about the mechanicals on um, Belcher Town Road. Does anybody else have questions? Is there anything else that you need to? Talk about Scott, uh, Mr. Hobley or Mr. Wagner for Belchertown Road before we move on to Southeast Street. I'm all set at this point. Great. Me as well, thank you. Good, let's, let's go to uh, Southeast Street. All right, we'll, uh, we'll start uh, here with, um, Let's go back again to the, the beginning here. You can uh, get yourself oriented to uh, the site plan here. We've, we've looked at this and we talked about parking along Southeast Street right here. And we've got a total of 31 units here at uh, at Southeast Street. So a uh, little, little less dense or a little smaller building, but fitting into a, a, a a different context. There, there are a lot more residential buildings immediately adjacent to, um, to the to the site here. So here's the aerial that we've seen before, uh, the field back here, our new proposed building. This is the schoolhouse building. We're going to talk some about the schoolhouse as well uh, when we discuss design here. But as you, I think you're probably all aware, you can see the density of the neighborhood um, immediate to, to our site. Again, uh, street view here. You can see the adjacent single family houses and our proposed building in the center. The inspiration for it is a, a sort of a New England, New England N style type of building. Then the, the rendering that we, we gave you a glimpse of last time, uh, and you can see the school here. We, this, is a, this is a pretty uh, dense site, you know, between the school, the new building, the parking, uh, there's a lot going on in this site, but we wanted to uh make sure that uh, the the school was still visible from the street you know there's there's a uh, cultural historic significance to it and and so this this gives you a sense of uh, a portion of the uh, school being or what it could, will look like um, from the street we've kind of shown some of that parking we talked about before you can see how the parallel spaces would uh, um, be placed here along the side of the street if they were to happen as as jamie described earlier the architecture itself, uh, a lot of a lot of gables. We've got dormers at the top floor, so it's a three-story building, uh, wood frame. It also would be uh, fiber cement, a combination of uh, board and batten and clapboards with asphalt shingled roof. So let's look here at the uh, at the floor plan. Some the only basement in the building is the basement that exists in the school itself, uh, and we've. We've done um, what we've done here is to try to use the basement for mechanicals as well as bike storage. Uh, there are several points of entry. There's one off the driveway here that you can come down to the stairs, a half a flight down to get into the bike storage. I'll try to increase that so you can read it a little bit. There we go. 
so bike storage down here. Laundry is also down here. Again, we'll look at that ratio. I think that was a good comment on, on uh, Belchtown Road, and we'll look at this here. We've got three washers, three dryers here. Um, that's pretty close to the one to 10, but I think it bears uh, 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 looking into again. And then we've got the other spaces down in the basement for mechanical, uh, a storage, and um, a jam. Well, it does come down to the basement. So it does make these spaces, the electrical room or the bike storage room and the laundry room accessible via the elevator. Then as we, we go upstairs to the first floor plan, it's always interesting to, to see how the first floor is arranged. Um, try to get this just a little bit bigger and there we go. So Southeast Street being out here, all of our parking that we looked at earlier is here. I'm gonna hear a little bit more about the, the transformer out front when Scott talks about it. Um, but the, the key here was to, to, to locate this new building, building facing Belchertown Road, and then think about how to connect it to the school. So we've got this narrow connector piece here with the elevator that needs to serve the school and the new building, but the floor levels are different elevations there. So there'll be half stops. Uh, sometimes the elevator, the door will open toward the school. Other times it's a half stop up, it'll, it'll open up towards the, the new building. So this becomes kind of the, the hub of the vertical circulation with a stair here, as well as the, uh, the elevator. We also wanted to try to uh, minimize the points of connection to the school so that we allow the, the expression of the, the original school design to shine forth. So we're reactivating the main stair that's been closed for some time. It's, it's a beautiful arch. It's got some really nice uh, masonry um, detailing on that. That will be reactivated as a, as a main entry to the units in the school. And then we've also taken care to uh, allow the, the masonry openings, the arches and window openings here uh, to remain visible. You'll actually be able to pass through some of those and you'll see the brick on the inside of the building. So we wanna retain all the character that we can when we connect the new link portion of the building to the school. The common areas in this building happen here primarily on this corner. So we have a community room here with a kitchenette bathrooms across from it, some office space here. And that's located uh, kind of at the, at the intersection so that it's, it's more easily accessed by residents in the new building as well as residents in the school can get uh, over to this community room area. And like the other building, um, we wanted to focus on outdoor space. And we think we've created a, a very welcoming kind of courtyard here that not only will help uh, um, work off of the community room in, in good weather to be able to access it directly, but to create a nice entry courtyard when people are driving and parking here, they'd come out uh, into the courtyard and then they can enter into this uh, the entrance to the new portion of the building at this location here. If they're walking, um, they'll be able to come here along the front and enter the building at, uh, facing Southeast Street and get to the uh, you know to the core of the building down this corridor. So there's really kind of two points of entry for the new building, one off of the main street and one off the courtyard. The school can also be entered off of the courtyard if somebody wants to come here to get their mail, mail being located here. We'll zoom in a little bit on this zone of it. So you can see coming in off the vestibule, mail room is located here you can get onto the elevator, or if you don't need to pick up your mail, you can come up the main, the stair into the school and get into the one of your uh, one of the units here if this is where you live. I can move on to the second floor, but maybe it seems like the first floor usually has the most activity, most program. So, any any thoughts or questions about the first floor? Just remind me what the colors stand for. Blues are sure. single or are one bedrooms. Yes. So uh, again, here this this um, this lighter purple. These are uh, this this is a three bedroom unit. You can see one, two, three bedrooms. 
here's the bath and a half full bath here and half bath there and the kitchen onto the living dining area. Then the, the dustier, uh, darker purple is the two bedroom. We go over into the school. You're going to see this is a series of, uh, of one bedrooms over here. These are, these are pretty generous one bedrooms over in the school. Um, uh, the, the, the square footage of them, let me zoom in a little bit here. You can see uh, 634 yeah. square feet here. You know, we've we've uh, often targeted 600, sometimes down a little bit less. So they're, they're pretty generous uh, one bedroom units in the school. Some of that has to do with working in with the within the existing envelope or confines of the school, uh, particularly the way the windows lay out. So we want to you know, respect uh, those windows leave. Um, as I think we're actually leaving all the windows. We may be opening up. Uh, remind me, Andrew, are we opening up some of the windows? That have been yeah, uh, lower the lower left uh, unit G. Those two sets of windows are bricked in, and I think I can't remember who I pointed that out to on our walk. Yeah, but uh, yeah, those will be those will be opened up. Yeah, so that's that's good. And then you'll see you're reusing the existing stair here as a means of egress, uh, as well as folks can get out this way, or they can uh, come via the elevator. And you'll see on the upper floor there's a, also a um, a, a hallway that will connect you to the uh, to the link. Great. We'll go to the second floor. Uh, again, staying focused on the school, we've got three more uh, units here, one bedroom units in the school. Uh, on the front corner, this would be above that entry, that arched entry that we saw earlier. There's a little common area here. Um, and folks uh, taking the elevator would come through this little lobby space into the elevator and be able to go uh, up or down. If they wanted to get into the new building, it'll be a half stop up or down. But there's also a set of stairs. So if you're on the second floor of the school, you can come through here and go to this, uh, go to the set of stairs that will take you down to the second floor of the, uh, of the new portion of the building. Again, we see a series of uh, two bedroom and three bedroom units on this second floor. All right. Then moving up to the top floor, we've got a flat roof on the school that could be used for future uh, photovoltaics. Elevator goes up to the third floor of the, the new portion of the building. Uh, the link that connects it comes across and we have uh, a series of uh, two bedroom units here. The, the kind of aqua color are one bedroom units. And then we've also included a, a studio apartment at the end. We had enough space to be able to do that. Right. And we'll quickly here look at the roof plan again. Similar to the other site, the front is a lot of uh, sloped roofs with dormers and the back side of it is our flat area for PV and uh, for mechanicals. Okay. We'll move to the elevations here that you saw in the in the uh, in the renderings. This is the uh, front elevation facing Southeast Street. Here's that entry that we saw earlier in the rendering. The school beyond series of gables. You can see this is board and batten on the top two floors with uh, uh, clapboards um, down here at the the lower level, and we've we've created kind of a a roof plane here, a small projecting roof plane here. It's not uh, uh, what it's not a literal porch, but it, it's kind of a reference to what uh, would traditionally have been a porch on on some of these buildings. Then the backside, you can see this is the flat uh, portion of the roof here. We're looking at the back of the school on this. So this is the, uh, the, the area that's gonna be uh, facing um, one of the abutters. Um, this is the elevation of that, uh, that gorgeous archway that we're reactivating on the school and a section here through that link, that hallway that we saw that connects the new building with the school. And then uh, we're looking here along the driveway. The, the parking is located here in the driveway that gets back toward the, the, 
the fields are over here. So these are the windows that Andrew talked about earlier that we're now opening up or reactivating. This is the courtyard space. There's a little entry canopy here. Um, and uh, it, it, it creates this nice little pocket that will also get the southern sun as it comes in. Some sections through the school here. And uh, this is a section through the, the, uh, the new building, uh, Southeast Street being over here. And then you're seeing the, uh, the other side of the school back here. Uh, we've got some uh, three-dimensional views. Again, this is more of a flat view uh, at the street, the front of it. Here are the parking spaces we looked at earlier and a view of the courtyard with the entry into the school. The community room being down here at this uh, corner, first floor. Uh, another view of the courtyard here, how the stairs spill into it and the entry off the parking there. And then an aerial view that lets you see not only the massing, but the flat roof versus the pitch roof portion of the building. All right, any questions? Again, you've got the, the cement fiberboard and both vertical and horizontal um, orientation towards those. And so it kind of varies as you look at different parts of the building, right? It breaks up the space. That's correct, right? And we are imagining more of a, uh, a more traditional uh, white uh, siding on this one, as we've shown here. And as you um, saw in the original, we'll go back to the beginning here, but as you saw in the original rendering, uh, looking at uh, black windows with, uh, with white cladding. Got it. Okay. Other, any questions on the architectural drawing? And the plans. Great. Let's move on to the um, mechanicals. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you. Anthony? Sure. So the mechanical system here is going to be similar, very similar to what we showed on the other building. So you're using the same basic air supply um, or air source heat pumps? Correct. Yeah, air source heat pumps. I'll, I'll just quickly pull it up so that we can see the minor difference. Oh, let me share my screen. Sorry. That's because I think we had a pretty good discussion of what those are. I'm assuming that they're just you have less tons for a smaller building. Exactly. Now this is a unit. It's uh, previously we had two 22 ton. Uh, systems at the other at uh, Belter Town. Here at Southeast, we have a 28 ton single. Um, it's also a dual module unit. Um, the plans quickly. So just a little bit of difference in terms of distribution here. We have one of the ERVs that I showed previously that's gonna be doing the ventilation air supply and exhaust for this port part of the building. And then because we have this long strip here, I'm not gonna run ductwork through there to feed the school portion of the building, but we have a separate ERV that just does the school portion. Um, this small little, suitcase heat pump serves the elevator machine so that's what that is there for and, you know i think mr gray the same question we had on Town is just will people be will they be visible and so you can take we can get a look at that sure yeah yeah bob i think if we can do some massing i can give you dimensions but yeah there this one you know there's going to be a higher degree of visibility here from the main road which is the main access way is this the street here. So, you know, this equipment here is hidden, but the equipment on top of the school is not as hidden because this is a flat roof completely. Um, no, no ridges or peaks on this roof. All right. Does anybody need more on the um, HVAC? Than what Anthony's given us. Oh, Craig, did you have something? Mr. Meadows, did you have something to say? Using heat pump hot water again? 
Yes, so similar design as the Belcher Town address. Mr. Gray, is there anything significantly different than what we had on Belcher Town aside from, aside from the size? Just the basement. Um, on that's really the only difference. We do have a basement, but we are still draining by gravity. We're able to meet the ember in the street um, from the basement here on uh, South East Street. Thank you. So that, that's pretty much it in terms of mechanicals, very similar to the other project like, like I showed and similar systems, heat pump, hot water, heat pump, HVAC, like a fully sprinkler building, no uh, fossil fuels. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Uh, Mr. Hoadley, anything special on the electrical? Okay, I think I'll, I can share my plan and kind of go over the site plan. I mean, the interior of the building, you know, the concepts of lighting controls and fire alarm and, and all that stuff is pretty similar. Um, let me share screen here. You're not going to be able to hide that big um, big box out in front. That's going to be the thing that will people are just going to have to see it. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, right? we spent a lot of time on this particular site, trying to work out, you know, where the best place to put the, you know, the pad mount transformer and how to get into the building and where to put the electric room. So unfortunately, the pad mount transformer ends up being out here by the street. And this is still going to be reviewed by Eversource, but it, I think it's really the only place we could put it. Um, we bring the, the, in this building here, because it's a smaller building, we only have a 2000 amp service, 2000 amp service, uh, equipment is located up in the third floor electric room um, because we were not able to really find any space on the lower levels to put it. So uh, that's one of the big differences between this site and Belcher Town is the electric room's not at grade. Um, so we do have provisions for the PV system. The PV disconnect is on the outside of the building. And then we do have two dual port uh, EV charging stations proposed uh, right here in the front of the building on these parking spaces. Exactly. Um, one of those is shared for the handicap accessible um, space as well. And then there's a spot for a future uh, EV charging. There again, it would share a uh, handicap accessible space and a normal parking space. So site lighting is similar um, concept. Um, I can share uh, later in the presentation, if you'd like, I can show uh, the uh, the the photometric file with the fixtures that we included in the package, um, but uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is we do have provisions on these sites for a roll up generator connection. Um, I had forgotten to mention this on the previous project, but there will be a cam lock generator connection box on the back side of the existing school building. <clears throat> so if power goes out, especially if it's going to be out for an extended period of time. You can roll a generator up back here, plug it in, power specific loads in the building um, to keep the building up and running uh, during the outage. So at least there's some places that, you know, have power in the building. So um, other than that, I think, uh, you know, electrically, it's uh, pretty similar to the other building. Um, Andrew, do you want me to share the, uh, the photometric file with the cut sheets at this point? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, I would think you'd like to see it. Um, briefly, yes. Yeah, I know okay. we can look it up, but just let's see it real briefly. Okay. So this is the the fixture cuts that were chosen. Can you make it bigger? Yeah, there we go. So, so these are the fixture cuts. These are the bollard style or bollard scale fixtures, and then these are the post top fixtures. So the LBs will be used. Um you know, along the the walkways, along the road, along the walkways, and then the, the uh, taller fixtures will be used for the parking areas. So that's okay. what we have so far. Um, you know, this is... And we can see the foldable take on Section 6A in our pack, in our uh, binders, right? The photovoltaic? Uh, yeah. That's I a mean, question the, for Jamie. Excuse me, the 
not the photo book take. I mean the light. Book. Yeah, they're they're the in the they're in the um the site and uh in civil drawings, and I believe six exhibit six A would be for I think uh it's it's A is denotes either Belcher Town Road or in and uh, B is I think um, thirty one Southeast Street, but I'll just confirm that. And, I, and plumbing is pretty much the same. Yes, plumbing. Um, and I guess overall, yes, the plumbing is the same. I'm not sure if you had any specific comment or question on that. But yeah, we do have a gravity system. We have the heat pump hot water system. Um, the only pump that we have is for the elevator sump pit. And the uh, fire protection is essentially the same as it is in Belcher Town. Right? Exactly. Um, the fire and water room. They are located at the basement at that South East. That, that's that's a good place. Great. Well, this um, I'm, I'll open up to questions from board members if there's any on the mechanicals, the architecture, or the electrical or lighting. Mr. Slobiter. Well, I guess this is as good a time as any. I don't know if later on I'll ha we'll have an opportunity. I want to go back to the laundry facilities for a moment and share a couple thoughts. I think laundry facilities are a quality of life issue. And with 47 units times four people, maybe on average per unit, on Belchertown, that's about 200 people. The other site, Southeast, is going to have at least 100 people in it. It's 31 units, but it's 56 bedrooms. And laundry is, I think, the only service for which people must, on a regular basis, leave their apartments. They don't have to socialize. They have to leave the building, but they have to go out, to do, out of their apartments to do laundry. And an inadequate number of machines and laundry facilities can be a conflict point in buildings like this when people leave their laundry go back to their apartment forget about it get tied up they don't get back quickly enough the machine is tied up and someone's waiting i'm i meant this is from personal experience in my younger days so also, four machines for Belchertown and three machines for 100 people living in Southeast seems to be a formula for overuse and breakdowns. And then when a machine breaks, there's even fewer machines until something is taken care of. And just because this project is below market price doesn't mean that the tenants should be subjected to a, a situation that is below standard. I think it's a matter of dignity. The chair brought up before that the design of the building is attractive and elegant and the kind of thing that will make residents want to take care of it more. And I think anything that encourages a sense of community and belonging and dignity can only be a positive thing. So, I would I think this is an important point for an ongoing way of life in these buildings. And I would like to see if there is in at all possible a way to design it so that there are laundry facilities on each floor. Uh, it's also a matter of of less laundry being dragged down elevators and hallways it's a different kind of tone so i'd like to see if that's possible these don't have to be grand spaces but i think they need to be adequate so this is why i brought it up in the first place i've been thinking about it a little more during the this meeting and i would request that you try and do something to make this situation a bit better Thank you, Mr. Chair. You bet. I'm, I, you know, I second uh, Mr. Slover's thoughts there. I know you said you'd go back and take a look at it, but I think you've heard from board members that, it's, you know, it's an important mm -hmm. issue. Uh, 
it is a quality of life issue. So take a look at that and, and we'll, you know, it may t- might take you a couple of weeks to figure that out, uh, but we look forward to hearing your thoughts on it when you can. We're ha- happy to do that. I, th- I think uh, location, I'm hearing, you know, need to look at location and also quantity. I, I know that well, some of them yeah. we can, we can do a stackable to increase the number, but uh, that may not always work on washing machines. I think it's easy to do on dryers, but I think the, the sort of the mechanics of washing machines, uh, I, as I understand it, for commercial units, uh, don't stack well. But but as you said, Mr. Wagoner, it's it's not only it's not only the number of units; it's the proximity and and easy access to it. So it's a couple of things. And I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, thank you for bringing it up. Other points, questions from members, uh, things you would like to hear back from the applicant on, from Wayfinders on. All right, well, let's, let's just, before we move on to a public comment, if any, let's just review the kinds of um, requests we have for you to make sure that we that um, you have a checklist. And, and Jacinta, I think you've been um, taking down notes on some of the things that the questions that board members have. But here's what I've got so far. Um, you're going to we have an answer on the oil tanks and you're going to seek to, res- to remove them. So I don't think you have to get back with us unless that changes. Um, we're going to have some information from you on the resident. You're going to look at the residential re- rental bylaw, and uh, we're going to talk about that at, at either next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, laundry has been a, we want to talk about that, and we'll get back to us then. Um, the HVAC system, we need to have, you're going to get back to us on the visibility of the HVA systems on the roof. And uh, we're going to look at, it's on us to look at the lighting in 6A and 6B to make sure that we, that the, uh, the study fits, the lighting study uh, is sufficient for us. Is there anything else that, questions that members had that we want to get an answer to or want them to come back with a response on? Okay, I think that was, I think that's it. All right. Um, this was very helpful. Oh, Mr. Gruber. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to um, the the schedule and just what we discussed, um, you know, first thing in the meeting. Um, yep. I have a, a little different agenda uh, layout, and I just wanted to confirm what the board is expecting um, next week for presentation. Uh, I know that we discussed having a response to the residential rent rental bylaw. However, okay. you had mentioned the um, stormwater review. Is that correct at each site? Yep. Stormwater I'll, management, stormwater okay. infrastructure design. Yeah, I'll need to confirm that with my team um, to make sure that they're available uh, for that. Um, next Jamie, week. We're, we're available the 26th for that. Okay, all right. Great, thank you, Coleman. Yeah, no problem. So we'll do, well, the residential rental, the stormwater, the two stormwater topics. The, um, if you have the, I guess it's up to you if you're gonna able, be able to get the drawings for the HVAC visibility on the roofs. Um, and laundry, I think it's probably gonna take a little longer than a week, but as soon as you can do that, or if you can give us an update on your progress, that would be helpful. Yep. And then, and then following that on the, um, the 10th would be, uh, property management and income restrictions. Is that. Yeah. And financials. I thought all those three property, in, property management, income restriction and financials. And then, um, applicant selection process and local, and local preference. And we are going to need to have, um, some time, which is not scheduled yet. But as we go through this, we'll see if there are other waivers that you're requesting, we'll have to go through it. There's a, a lot of waivers that you're requesting, and we'll have to spend some time going through those, but we don't have to schedule that uh, for uh, 
this time because that will occur later in October or perhaps November. Make sense? It's a reasonable, reasonable schedule? Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I would just like to clarify one thing, um, you know, with the financials, we'll t just talk about the types of funding sources that we're going to, um, you know, that that we're going to be kind of getting as as far as in in, in um, looking to fund the project with. That's what that's what we understand the financials um, section to be and talking about sort of like what a typical rent would be, you know, for the units and, and things like that. And I guess what my my thought always is. Show me that this is is economically feasible, so that it's not going to come back to the town. That, you're, that you have enough financial, the plan is um, sufficient, so that you're going to have enough rental income to maintain the property to, to service whatever debt you have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's my main concern: is not whether you make money, or how much money you make, or how much money you're able to, um, not profits, but earnings you're able to retain as a nonprofit, but I'm, what I want to make sure is that you have sufficient income coming in to keep the project going. Okay. Yeah. We'll, um, yeah, we'll have a response for, 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 to that as well. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, that's, I think we've accomplished a lot tonight. I'm, I'm still really excited about this program, uh, your application. I think the work that you've done with the town is great. I think the drawings I've seen are, are really, um, I'm very encouraged by it. And I look forward to our, our future meetings. Um, Ms. Murray, is there anything that we need to be doing that we haven't talked about yet from a legal standpoint? You just need uh, to see if there's any member of the public this evening that, okay. that wishes to comment. We'll do that and we'll continue the, continue the public hearing before we, uh, after we do that. All right. Um, so we're going to move to public comment. If there's any public comment, um, let's see, do we have anybody uh, attendees? I see one. Oh, Mr. Malloy, did you wish to speak? Sure. Yes, I was just going to ask. Um, Wayfinders is going back to the Conservation Commission uh, before the next meeting, and so if we're talking about stormwater, I just want to confirm that that is design is you know pretty close to what will be reviewed by the conservation commission just in case we need to flip-flop the you know the process of review or what we're looking at um so i just want to make sure that that you know if we look at it next that it's accurate and it won't necessarily change a lot so we've, know, we've, quite, we've yeah. made some updates um to the stormwater plan uh since the original presentation we had a couple weeks ago to this board um, our CONCOM hearing, we're actually continuing to the 9th at this point, um, just to give us a little bit more time to coordinate with this board and the Conservation Commission on all the comments. So we have a, a uh, cohesive response for the, for both boards. Sure. Oh, well, so, you Thanks, won't be but, so do you think that, that... Go ahead, Mr. Malay. Right, so I just want to ask that, do you know... Right. How the Conservation Commission will review the changes, you know, because we, you know, it's it to me, it seems like the ZBA would want to wait for view right. until the Conservation Commission has also seen it or given some kind of consensus about it. You know, we don't want to go over it twice. If you're, if, if there's going to be changes from the ConCon, we want to see what, we want to see what their thinking is before we review it. And then yeah. Yeah, and we did already have our initial hearing with the CONCOM and we've incorporated those comments into our plans already. So I, I don't expect there to be any more like substantial changes, maybe just minor ones. So I wouldn't expect the stormwater strategy to really be changing um, from what we would be presenting to you. But uh, Jamie, I defer to you if you do want to push it off a little bit longer. Um, maybe we could check with the conservation agent just to confirm that and um, let you know. Is that? I yeah, so why don't Nate um, and Ms. Brestrup and Jacinta, why don't you coordinate with Mr. Gruber and try to make sure that we're not, uh, that we got a, that we're up to date and that we're not um, gonna have to go over something twice. All right, if there's minor changes, that's understandable, you can inform us of that. If there's wholesale changes, I don't wanna have to do it twice. Okay. 
Good. All right. Any other um, public comments? If you wish to comment, please raise your hand, um, either on the, um, the Zoom app or on your phone by dialing star nine. I think there's none. I don't see any. Do you, Ms. Williams? All right. So um, I would entertain a motion that we continue the public hearing on DEA FY 2025-04 Wayfinders, Inc. until uh, September 26th at 6 o'clock. So moved. And is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloganer? Aye. The vote is four to nothing with one absent. The motion carries. The me this meeting is continued until the 26th at 6 o'clock. The next order of business is um, public discussion of any matter not before the board tonight. So if anybody from the public wants to speak about anything other than this, um, now's your time to do so. Raise your hand on Zoom or press pound or star nine on your phone. We, I don't see anybody out there that wishes to do that. The next order of business is um, anything not brought up in the last 24 hours or 48 hours, excuse me. And I think mostly it's just the schedule. So Ms. Williams, we have on the 26th, we have stormwater. On the 10th of October, do we have two, do we have other things on the agenda? Or are we still just um, going to be wayfinders on October 10th? Oops, Miss, Miss Williams, I can't hear you if you're speaking. Jacinta, do you have your um, ear mouthpiece near your mouth? Thank so you. sorry, guys. There, it was out of the way. So October 10th, Jonathan Clayt is coming back, Redgate Lane. Um, oh. So it's not the only thing. Wayfinders is not the only thing that night. Okay. We have Redgate Lane that night. Mr. Yes. Sloper, you're not here that night. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And the 17th, Mr. Meadows, you're available on the 17th? I am. Okay. Okay, and then coming up on the 14th of November, we have Shootsbury Road, so or Shootsbury Solar. So those are the only big items. Um, we don't have any other applications in at this time. Great. Well, good. Well, I think we're making real progress on, on uh, this. We don't want to rush it, and we want to make sure we have enough information to make a final decision. But I think the one thing we should do at some point, Ms. Williams, is schedule a, wave, a, a meeting some meeting time on the numerous waivers that are requested by the applicant. We have to go through those and make a finding on that. I think a good day for that would be the 24th, if I'm not well, mistaken. I'm not, it'd be a good one, except I'm not here. Oh, that's right. You're, you're out that day. That is correct. Okay. Um, so, the next Wayfinders only meeting would be November 21st. Well, we can. Yes, Mr. Sloboda. I also have a notation. I uh, I don't know if it's correct that uh, on November fourteenth that Wayfinders is also on the schedule for the fourteenth for half of the meeting or something like that. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, yes. okay. You didn't... So on the fourteenth, you only mentioned the solar project, so I didn't know if Wayfinders was still there. Thank you. I think you know maybe maybe we could think about the fourteenth for the waivers discussion. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Good. Okay. Any other questions from board members, suggestions, thoughts? All right. Um, if there's nothing else, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. This is not debatable. The vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Sloboder. Aye. The vote is four to zero with one absent. The motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you everybody for uh, your hard work and 
Thank you, Wayfinders, for a good presentation. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.